Grace to you and peace in the name of God's beloved Jesus Christ, our Lord. Good morning and welcome to this worship service on August the 23rd here at the Leland Community United Methodist Church. It is good to be together today. I can see what you cannot see. Those of you who are watching back home, there are about 20 of us on a regular basis here, so we can add 50 more if you are so inclined. We do have the space that can uh, assist us in staying safe from each other, but also being able to worship together. Several of you have let us know that in the past couple of Sundays, the sound not quite what it uh, should have been. Thank you for letting us know, and I hope you will also let us know if the sound is improved today. We have made some adjustments to our equipment, so hopefully that will improve for those who are watching at home. Again, if you have not done so yet, the outline of the worship service is found on our website and you can download it from there or take it from your email that was mailed out on Saturday. But everything here in the church is projected on the screen. So we are singing. The hymn for the day is, I have decided to follow Jesus. And let us sing uh, the first verse together. Would you stand? Let us share together in our call to worship. If it had not been for the Lord who reached out to us, we would have perished in our own selfishness. If it had not been for the Lord who healed our wounds, we would have stopped the Praise be to God who reaches out to us, healing and restoring our lives. All thanks be to God for the many ways in which our lives have been blessed. Amen. Please be seated. Let us share together in our morning prayers. Lord our God, united with people around the world, we hold in our hearts and in our prayers the people of Beirut, Lebanon, a massive explosion in the port area killed over 200 people and injured thousands of others. And civil unrest continues. We pray, God of all people, that your spirit of healing and protection be with the people of Beirut and Lebanon at this time. May the good news of peace and loving care be with all who live in this country, in this city of Beirut, especially those suffering as a result of the disaster. May the terrifying sounds of explosion, ambulance sirens, and the cries of those trapped in buildings give way to sounds of courage and hope. 
We pray for the people in California who are once again in harm's way as wildfires are devastating large portions of that state. We pray for all who had to leave home and find shelter somewhere else. We pray for firefighters and helpers who go above and beyond the call of duty to contain the raging flames and calm the broken hearts of those who have lost so much. May the smell of acrid smoke, burning buildings and remains soon give way to a renewed sense of God's loving presence and strength. May there be real cooperation between rescue workers, government personnel, and civilians so that true justice and peace might break through for all and people's deep suffering will be alleviated. We pray for our own community here and especially our teachers and students as they are busy preparing for a new and very different school year. May you, O oh God, inspire and comfort every person who is affected by the unsettling effects of this worldwide pandemic. And as people learn new ways to be the Church of Jesus Christ in a new day and age. Together we come before you today and lift up the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you to Becky for playing for us today and lifting our spirits with her music. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew in the 16th chapter. And the particular passage we are going to hear 
and reflect upon today has to do with people's misunderstanding of who Jesus is and wanting to know, who are you? When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of death will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Living God, help us hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand. And understanding, we may believe. And believing, we may follow you in all faithfulness and obedience. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to start our time together with asking for a raise of hands for anyone who likes a good game show. Especially a game show where you have to guess words or facts, historical facts, anything like that. Jeopardy. Anybody? All right, there are a few hands going up. Okay. One of the game shows that comes to my mind is the perennial newlywed game. It actually doesn't have to be newlyweds. It works for people who have had their silver anniversary, their golden anniversary, their rock solid anniversary. It works for them too. But here's the basic premise of the newlywed game. Relatively newlywed couples compete against each other. Spouses and are separated. And first, the husbands are asked questions about their wives. Then the wives come in and have to guess how their husbands answered the question. Then the roles are reversed. The husbands go out, the wives talk about um, what they think their husbands would say about the question being raised to them. And the point is to make as many points as possible to win the fabulous prize of the day. Aside from the sometimes naughty questions that come up with this, as if newlyweds only had one thing on their minds, it can be quite entertaining if you can stand the thing. And it's interesting to see how well couples know each other and can guess each other's answers or how well or how far they are away from responding correctly. Which begs the question, doesn't it, of how do we truly know the people closest to us? And on another question or another level, 
how well do we know ourselves? The Greek philosopher Socrates is credited with creating the timeless words, the unexamined life is not worth living. And whether we like questions, deep questions for that matter, or not, they can be extremely helpful in shaping our lives, the course of our lives, and all these things. Let me pick just a handful of questions out of literally thousands of possible candidates. Questions of life. Where will my life be in one, five, or ten years if I continue doing what I am doing today? You know, easy stuff like this. Feel free to shout out your answer as soon as you've made it up. What would I do if I wasn't afraid of anything? Do I care more about how my life looks or how it actually feels? Am I comfortable in my own skin? What will my biggest regret be if I were to die tomorrow? Is my social circle influencing my life positively or negatively? And the easiest one for the rest, for the close, what do I want people to say about me at my funeral? I'm sure you all had time to think about this. You're ready to come up with the answer right now. Or maybe, just maybe, you're saying, wait a minute. I haven't really thought about these things. For most of my life, I have been surrounded by people that are quick on their feet, always ready to come up with an answer as soon as the teacher asks one. And I'm not talking about you know, these deep questions, but just in general. People without fail could give a ready answer to whatever question anyone throws at them. But that's not the way I roll. I need space to think, a place where I can live with the question for a while before I even hazard an answer which is somewhat detrimental in our fast-paced life when people send you a text and expect an immediate answer. And sometimes I just have to text back and say, give me a moment to think. This is no longer the Old West when you shoot from the hip and ask questions later. I'd rather think before I answer. Because much of our modern communication, we no longer see each other face to face. I cannot read your reaction. I cannot see whether the question you ask me is one supported by a smile or a frown. So we do well to think before we answer. As a young adult, I literally carried a small volume of Raina Maria Rilke's letters to a young poet everywhere I went. And in this book, the German lyricist responded to questions by a young man writing to him, wanting to know, how do I become a poet? How do I find out what to write about? Let me share a brief excerpt from one of Rilke's letters, where he encourages the recipient to sit with the question. Sit with what you don't know and trust that the questions themselves will eventually provide answers. Be patient, Rilke wrote, toward all that is unresolved in your heart. Try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are written in a foreign language. 
Do not seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. The point is to live everything. Live the questions now, and perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. So thinking about our Bible text for this morning from Matthew's Gospel, why would Jesus ask a question such as this of his disciples? Who do you say I am? Well, one thing we know, it's certainly not because Jesus has no idea who he is. He knows who he is. But first, Jesus simply asks his disciples, who do people say I am? In other words, what is the word on the street? What have you heard? What do the opinion polls suggest? And this is obviously an easy question to answer. I'm grateful for Reflections on the Gospel readings by Debbie Thomas that has inspired me for this message. See, the disciples are not prone to hide away in some kind of ivory tower now that they belong to the Jesus Club and no longer have time to hang out with ordinary people. No, they know what their neighbors, their family members, their friends think. We know that they have not lost touch with those around them by the answers they provide. Answers that literally are based on the religious factions that they tend to lean to. If I may put this in contemporary language, it would be something like this. Do you want to know who you are, Jesus? Well, here's what the Lutheran take is on you. Oh, and there are the Episcopalians. They have this understanding of who you are. The Roman Catholics over here, they have this view that they represent. Pentecostals, well, woo, they're really excited about you. And Methodists, yeah, they have an opinion too. Jesus wants to know from his disciples whether the people have recognized him for who he is. Do they understand his mission? Do they understand his deep commitment to bring the kingdom of God about in their lifetime? Or has everybody missed the mark and fall so short? of even having the slightest clue. The words of the evangelist John came to mind. Words he wrote in the prologue to his gospel where he says, he was in the world, the world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they did not want him. What is interesting in this account from Matthew's pen is Jesus neither affirms nor denies any of his disciples' answers. He simply listens, allowing his friends to offer up everything they think they know based on other people's preferences, ideas, and expert opinions. And this my friends, is where all explorations of faith begin. In naming what we have heard, examining what we understand and then have inherited, and parroting back the certainties others have given to us. Such answers cost us little. They are safe, they are benign. But there is no intimacy in them, no personal stakes, no investment, and no fire. 
naming what we have heard from others, repeating what we inherited from our parents, our pastors, or peers, they are useful to start our exploration of faith. But we cannot build our life of faith based upon hearsay. At some point, the question comes to each one of us individually, the question that Jesus raises in this gospel reading today, who do you say I am? Hence the backdrop behind me on the screen. How do you fill in the blank of Jesus is to me? Not to Cho, not to Sally, to you. So Jesus presses on, but what do you say I am? He asks every single one of his disciples. And he awaits a more intimate answer. It's almost as Jesus was saying, forget about other people's theologies and interpretations. Put aside tradition and creed, valuable as they are, and consider the life we have lived together thus far, the bread we have broken with each other, the miles we have walked, the burdens we have carried, the tears we have shed, the laughter we have shared. Who am I to you? How have you experienced me? Matthew doesn't give us much detail about what happens next. But you have been there and I have been there in situations where there is this awkward silence. I see the disciples falling into this pattern. People shuffling their feet, nervous coughs, <coughs> casting anxious glances at each other, just below the brow, hoping desperately that someone else will give an answer. Anybody been there? Have the t-shirt? And I imagine Jesus standing patiently and vulnerably in their midst to that long and awkward silence waiting to hear what his closest friends will say about him. Do they know him? Do you and I know him? Have we learned to trust his heart and his words? How much have we comprehended of his mission and vision? And how much are we willing to confess out loud? And do we love Jesus enough to take risks? When the silence becomes unbearable, Peter throws himself forward and answers the question as confidently as he can. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's a perfect A-plus answer. The whole gospel story in a nutshell. The truth with a capital T. Right? Well, sort of. Yes, Jesus commends Peter and blesses him for his answer. Jesus says to him that he will build his church upon the rock of Peter's confession. And he promises Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But you know and I know that this is not the end of the story. Because as we continue reading, 
in chapter 16 of Matthew. We know that when Jesus goes on to describe the suffering and the humiliation that he will have to endure as he continues to live out the call of God upon his life, Peter quickly backtracks, pulls Jesus aside, and basically tells him to shut up. That is no way for you to talk about the Messiah. Peter's insistence that Jesus somehow fit into his watered-down comprehension of divinity hits a nerve so raw that Jesus turns and rebukes Peter in words that shock us even today. Get thee behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind on earthly things and not on divine things. We tend to live in the dangerous illusion of a manageable God today. As long as we can define Jesus in and on our terms, we are okay. This desire to own a manageable Jesus who can be controlled by us is really nothing new though. In the radio broadcast during the years of World War II, Britain, C.S. Lewis, said this about our misjudging the character of Jesus. I am trying here to prevent anyone seeing and saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is one of the things we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a good moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman and something worse. You can't shut him up for a fool. You can't spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So much for C.S. Lewis. And as soon as Peter thinks he has the answer to the question, who do you say I am, nailed down, Jesus shuts him up. Jesus challenges what Peter knows and not just him back to the starting line. Yes, I am the Messiah. But no, Peter, you have no idea what Messiah really means. You can barely tolerate me talking about it. There's so much more for you to learn, Peter. So many more answers for you to grow into. Be patient. Don't force the locked doors. Try to love what is unsolved. Keep living the question. When I think about the whole story of Peter's life, I am stunned by the answers that Peter must have lived into towards the end of his life. Answers he never could have articulated in the very beginning of his time with Jesus, but something, the longer he lived with the questions he grew into. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks Peter. 
And many, many years later, Peter is finally able to respond with a certain degree of assurance. You are the one who found me in a fishing boat and gave me a new vocation. You are the one who said, yes, Peter, get out of the boat and walk on the water. You are the one who rescued me from drowning. You are the one who glowed on the mountaintop while I babbled nonsense. You are, the wa- you are the one who washed my feet while I squirmed in shame. You are the one who told me that I would be a coward when I needed to be brave for you. You are the one I denied three times to save my own skin. You are the one who looked into my eyes with pain and pity when the cock crowed. You are the one who fed me breakfast at the beach and spoke love and fresh purpose into my humiliation. You are the one who gave me the courage to preach to 3,000 people on Pentecost. You are the one who stayed by my side through insults, beatings, and persecutions. And you are the one I followed into martyrdom. You are the Christ, the living Son of God. Who do you say Jesus is? Who has he been to you in the past? Who is Jesus now to you? And who do you hope Jesus will be in the future? These, quite frankly, are questions to ponder for a lifetime. Questions that have so many other questions folded into them, we will never exhaust the possibilities to respond, to confess, to bear witness. Is Jesus simply a great moral teacher? Or is Jesus your Lord and Savior? What Peter learns in this encounter is that Jesus is just as powerfully present in the questions as he is in the answers. Perhaps even more so. To love what is unsolved is not to deny Jesus' lordship. It is okay to say, I do not know yet who you are, Jesus. I'm still exploring, I'm still trying to figure this out. But it is to allow Jesus to enter more deeply into our hearts than any interpersonal claim that we may have will ever do. So live the questions, beloved of Christ. For this is Jesus' invitation to us, and he makes it over and over and over again to us because he loves us because he wants us to be his friends to be his disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Our hymn for today, I have decided to follow Jesus, is only partially correct. Yes, we decided to follow Jesus, 
but not by our own volition, but because as John reminds us in his gospel, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So all we ever do is follow Jesus. Let us stand as we sing the final verse. Dear friends, we will meet again next week at 10 o'clock here at the Leland Community United Methodist Church. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in supporting the ministry of this church by your faithful tithe and offerings. Continue to lift the questions, discover new ways in which we can be the church wherever we are right now due to this strange situation we find ourselves in the church of jesus is not gone it's simply dispersed you are a disciple of jesus christ wherever you are this morning go then in the name of jesus christ May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord at his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord always look with favor upon you and grant you his peace for this hour and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.